Throughout history, holidays have been riddled with mysterious disappearances, strange occurrences, and unsolvable cases. And in a few different occasions, there have even been supposed threats of alien invasions. Today, we'll be looking at 30 Christmas mysteries. But before we start the video, I'd like for you guys to check out our new channel, Bill Knows, and subscribe if you'd like. We've already started to upload new content over there, and you can find the link in the description. It'd mean the world to us if you checked it out, but let's get started with the video. Number 30. Nicole Betterson was born to Jarrett Betterson and Susan Klingel. In September of 1977, the family was involved in a car accident that caused Susan to lose her life. Fortunately, Nicole and Jarrett were not seriously injured, and Nicole received social security benefits as a result of her mother's demise. Soon, Jarrett had a new girlfriend, Barbara, and the two had plans to take Nicole with them. Barbara promised Susan's parents that she would take good care of their granddaughter, and that she, Nicole, and Jarrett were planning to move out west to start a new life. They never really said where they were going, though. Some friends thought they were going to California, while others thought they were headed for Las Vegas. After they left for wherever they were going, the Klingles never saw Nicole again. Twenty years later, Bill and Mary Klingle hired a private investigator to find Nicole, who would be 22 years old. The investigator found Jarrett and Barbara living in poverty and poor health in Las Vegas, but there was no trace of Nicole and no paper trail for her whatsoever, except for her Social Security orphan's benefits, which her father picked up every month until Nicole turned 18. There was no evidence that Nicole had ever made it out west with her father and stepmother all those years ago. After late 1977, she simply ceased to exist. In November of 1997, a Las Vegas police detective visited Jarrett. He lied and said he knew what happened to Nicole and promised Jarrett leniency if he would just tell the truth. Jarrett promised to get back to the detective in about a week to discuss what he knew. A few weeks later, Jarrett executed his wife Barbara and then took his own life. In a final letter to Jarrett's mother in Georgia, Barbara wrote that she didn't want to live without her husband and she apologized for everything, claiming they had a sad and difficult life. Jared and Barbara left an envelope containing $900 and a money order to pay for cremation. Nicole has still never been found. Number 29. In December of 1978, strange lights were reported by hundreds of people, including credible eyewitnesses like pilots and air traffic controllers. Air traffic radars in Wellington and Belheim also recorded some activity. An Australian TV crew then filmed the lights, with their video causing a sensation worldwide. The first sightings were seen on the 21st of December, when the crew of a safe air limited cargo aircraft began observing a series of strange lights around their Armstrong Whitworth AW660 Argosy aircraft. They were able to track it with their aircraft before they disappeared and reappeared elsewhere. The witnesses saw a large UFO with five white flashing lights that were visible on the craft. Some people said that they could see little disks drop from the UFO and then disappear. The pilots described some of the lights to be the size of a house and others were small but flashing brilliantly. These objects appeared on the air traffic controller radar in Wellington and also on the aircraft's onboard radar. Following the sightings, the Royal New Zealand Air Force, the police, and the Carter Observatory in Wellington cooperated in an investigation, the results of which were logged in the National Archives in Wellington. A declassified New Zealand Defense Force file attributed the sightings to a freak propagation of radio and light waves, an unusually bright Venus, and the lights of a squid fishing fleet, cars, and even trains. It turns out it was a natural phenomenon that could only be explained logically. Number 28. Mary Celeste was an American merchant that was found adrift and deserted in the Atlantic Ocean off the Azores Islands, which was surprising because the weather at the time had been clear. Plus, the crew aboard Mary Celeste was quite experienced. The Mary Celeste was also in a seaworthy condition when it rolled towards the Strait of Gibraltar. So what could have happened? The ship began its last voyage on November 7, 1872, sailing with seven crewmen and Captain Benjamin Spooner Briggs, his wife Sarah, and the couple's two-year-old daughter Sophia. The 282-ton ship battled heavy weather for two weeks to reach the Azores Islands, where the ship log's last entry was recorded at 5 a.m. on November 25th. Less than a month later, on December 5th, a passing British ship found Mary Celeste abandoned. Everyone on board the ship had disappeared. 
Aside from several feet of water in the hold and a missing lifeboat, the ship was undamaged and loaded with six months of food and water. The cargo appeared untouched and the personal belongings of the passengers and crew remained where they were, including valuables. Their disappearance is regarded as the greatest nautical mystery of all time. Much speculation has circulated about what happened to the crew. Theories range from alcohol to smoke to paranormal explanations for alleged aliens, UFOs, sea monsters, and the supposed Bermuda Triangle. The Mary Celeste is often depicted as a prototype ghost ship since it was found abandoned without any explanation. Number 27. On the night of December 20th, 1980, 19 year old Jean Hilliard was driving to her parents' home in Minnesota along a country road. While on the way, the car slid off the road and got stuck in a ditch. Instead of waiting for help, she decided to walk a few miles to her friend Wally Nelson's house, which was two miles away in the below 25 degree weather. She was hardly dressed for the cold weather with just a jacket, pants, and cowboy boots. After an hour, she made it to her friend's house, but she collapsed due to the cold before she could reach the door. The temperature dropped to negative 22 degrees and Hilliard was found the next morning at 7 a.m. Her body was supposedly frozen solid after being out there in the cold for six agonizing hours, but she was rushed to the hospital. Her skin had become so hard that doctors couldn't pierce it with hypodermic needles and the body temperature was so low that a thermometer could not get a reading. The doctors were worried that if Jean did regain consciousness, which seemed like a remote possibility, she might have serious brain damage. Furthermore, the frostbite was so severe that doctors thought she may never recover. After hours of being heated in an electric blanket with heating pads, Hilliard began to revive. Three days later, she was able to move her legs again. Despite beliefs that what she had gone through would cause her to lose her life, Jean Hilliard was discharged after 49 days in the hospital. Thankfully, she's not suffered any permanent damage to her body or her brain. Number 26. Flight 19 was the code name for a group of five General Motors Eastern Aircraft Division TBM Avengers that disappeared over the Bermuda Triangle on December 5, 1945. All 14 airmen on the flight were lost, as were all 13 crew members of the Martin PBM Mariner flying boat that subsequently launched from Naval Air Station Banana River to search for Flight 19. The flight was supposed to be a routine navigation exercise and mock bombing run of a concrete shipwreck just south of Bimini, inside the so-called Bermuda Triangle. The plan was to go towards the east into the sea for 56 nautical miles up to Hens and Chicken Shoals for some drills. It was a typical sunny Florida day, but at about 3.30 p.m., Lieutenant Charles Carroll Taylor, the flight leader, sent a message to the control tower. He said his compass was malfunctioning and he thought he was somewhere over the Florida Keys, which is a chain of islands just south of Florida. At 3.45 p.m., Taylor's voice was heard again at the control towers. This time he sounded worried and confused. He said that they were off course and that the land was not visible to them. Flight 19's radio transmissions soon became increasingly faint and it meandered out to sea. When fuel began to run low, Taylor was heard prepping his men for a potential crash landing in the ocean. A few minutes later, the Avengers' last radio communications were replaced by an eerie buzz of static. The Navy immediately scrambled to hunt for the missing patrol. Around 7.30 p.m., a pair of PBM Mariner flying boats took off from an air station north of Fort Lauderdale. Just 20 minutes later, one of them seemed to follow Flight 19's lead by suddenly vanishing off the radar. The remains of the Mariner and its 13 crewmen were never recovered. Many believe the wrecks of Flight 19 and its doomed rescue plane may still lurk somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle. But while the search continues to this day, no definitive signs of the six aircraft or the 27 crewmen have ever been found. Number 25. Patty Vaughn went missing on Christmas Day in 1996. Two months before Patty disappeared, the 32-year-old woman and her husband of 13 years, Jerry Ray Vaughn, also known as JR, decided to separate. The couple lived in Texas with their three children, who were nine, seven, and six at the time. JR moved into an apartment in San Antonio while Patty stayed at the house with the children. Patty soon became romantically involved with a former boyfriend named Gary, whom she introduced to her family at a Christmas Eve gathering. JR was meant to visit Patty at home to have Christmas dinner with their kids before she took them to her cousin's house that night. However, Patty never showed up and did not phone her cousin to let her know that she wasn't coming. 
At around 1.30 p.m. on December 26th, Patty's boss discovered her abandoned van by the side of the road with a flat tire on Texas Highway Loop 1604. The location was approximately 15 miles from Patty's house and 5 miles from her workplace. JR had claimed that he spent most of Christmas Day fighting with Patty over her relationship with her new boyfriend. JR's sister, Marilyn, was scheduled to join them for Christmas dinner, but when Marilyn arrived, JR told her that Patty was inside the bedroom and didn't want to talk to anyone because she wasn't feeling well. He asked Marilyn to take the three children to a relative's house for Christmas dinner. After the kids left, JR said that he got into another heated argument with Patty before she stormed out of the house sometime after 6.30 p.m. and drove away in her van, but never returned. The same day Patty's van was found, JR filed for divorce from Patty and moved back into the house with the children. A detective confirmed that JR had always been considered a suspect in Patty's case, but there's not been enough evidence to charge him. Number 24. On the night of December 9, 1965, a sonic boom caused fireball streaks across the North American skies before crashing in the woods near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, which was seen by thousands of eyewitnesses. The object was described as a fireball that crashed into the woods and was later described as a large metal bell-like structure the size of a Volkswagen Beetle with Egyptian hieroglyph-like markings etched onto it, about 8 feet long, in the shape of an acorn. Search teams were called in to locate the actual crash site. Volunteer firemen Jim Mays led one team of state troopers to the ravine and located the site from an overlook above the ravine after Jim noticed several blue flashing lights coming from the area. 30 volunteer firemen began searching for the object in the ravine. James Romansky, a volunteer fireman, was part of the search team who located the object, and he didn't believe that the object was an aircraft and noticed strange writings on it. The men were told to leave the site as the military arrived. The site was cordoned off by the military, and all of the civilians were refused entry. The military promptly swarmed the area, hauling Volkswagen bus-sized objects away to an Air Force base in Ohio. The Pentagon subsequently insisted that it was a meteorite, but fought tooth and nail to keep the information secret, drawing the attention of not only UFOlogists but public figures like John Podesta. Then in 2005, NASA released a statement reporting that experts had examined metallic fragments from the area and determined that they were from a Russian satellite that re-entered the atmosphere and broke up, but their records of the findings were lost in the 1990s. Number 23. Oliver Larch has become folklore in America. Like all good tales, there are multiple versions of the fable, each with slight variations in the details such as the spelling of his name, the location of the mysterious event he was involved in, and even his age. According to legend, in 1889, a Christmas Eve gathering was held on a farm near South Bend, Indiana. The landscape was bright with new fallen snow, yet heavy clouds hung low, making the sky dark and dreary. The happy guests beaming from a wonderful dinner included a lawyer from Chicago who was a longtime friend of the family, a judge from South Bend, and a local minister and his wife. They were all well acquainted and had a history with each other, and with the Larch family. 11-year-old Oliver Larch popped popcorn for the group in the kitchen, while they retired to the parlor for conversation, games, and to sing Christmas carols that Mrs. Larch played on the organ. This was a familiar get-together that the group looked forward to every year and they truly enjoyed each other's company. It was just before 11 p.m. when Oliver's father asked him to run back to the well and bring a bucket of fresh water, as the available drinking water for the party was almost gone. Oliver took the bucket outside the door, and about 10 seconds later, he screamed for help, saying, they've got me. The cries were heard from inside, but they grew fainter and fainter until they could no longer be heard. His father grabbed a kerosene lantern as the guests poured into the yard to see what could be the matter with the boy. They examined his tracks with the lantern light. The tracks in the snow ended halfway to the well, about 30 feet from the house. Oliver was gone and it was like something had picked him up from above. He weighed about 75 pounds, too big to be grasped and lifted by an eagle. To this day, no one has ever explained how a young boy stepped off a porch for a bucket of water and vanished into the night sky. Number 22. On the 26th of December, 1900, a small ship was making its way to the Flannan Islands. Its destination was a lighthouse at Aileen Moor, a remote island that was completely uninhabited. Captain James Harvey was tasked with delivering a relief lighthouse keeper as part of a regular rotation. 
The journey was delayed a few days by bad weather, and when Harvey and his crew finally arrived, it was clear that something was wrong. None of the normal preparations at the landing dock had been made. The flagstaff was bare, and none of the keepers came to greet them. The keepers, as it turned out, weren't on the island at all. All three of them had vanished. Once they were close to the port, Captain Harvey asked the crew to investigate. Perhaps the keepers weren't aware of their arrival, which was understandable. When the crew approached the lighthouse, he noticed the front gate was unlocked. They entered and called out to anyone inside, but no one answered. Sure enough, when they entered the mess hall, they were shocked at the sight before them. The clock on the wall had completely stopped. The table was made up and there were plates still full of food, meat, potatoes, and pickles. The lamp was ready for lighting, and two of the three oilskin coats belonging to Thomas Marshall, James Ducat, and Donald MacArthur were gone. The gate and door were firmly shut. These clues only led to more questions. Why would one of the keepers have gone out without his coat? And for that matter, why would all three have left, together when all of their rules forbid it? Further investigations also led nowhere, though the lighthouse logbook provided a new set of confounding details. On December 12th, an entry from Marshall described severe winds the likes of which they'd never seen before in 20 years. He wrote that Ducat had been quiet and MacArthur had been crying, which would have been odd behavior for a man with a reputation as a tough and experienced seafarer. Speculation ran wild. Was it something supernatural, sea creatures, a case of madness? Who knows? Number 21. Jack Mechanod, his wife Pierrette, and their two sons, Eric and Bruno, drove the short distance from their home in Kyonyak on the afternoon of Sunday, the 24th of December, 1972. They were planning to have a midnight meal to celebrate the start of Christmas. The evening was a calm and relaxing one, with little happening that was out of the ordinary. At around 1 a.m., Jack started to prepare for their journey back home a journey estimated to be about four kilometers. However, a thick fog had settled over the town, making it difficult to see even five meters ahead. Despite this, Jack and his family drove into the night, but they were never seen again. It took a while for the authorities to respond to the disappearance of Jack and his family. An official search didn't start until January. When the authorities entered Jack's house, the Christmas presents were untouched and the oysters and turkey in the fridge suggested they never made it home. From January 10th onward, the search for the family was taken to new proportions. A helicopter was used to conduct an aerial search and divers searched the surrounding water bodies. The waters were difficult to navigate as they were dirty, but after checking the banks of the rivers and not seeing any foot or tire tracks, the authorities concluded that the family could not have ended up in any rivers. Unsurprisingly, many people had different theories as to what had happened to the family. There was talk of Pierrette having an affair outside of her marriage and how this may have provoked Jack. Some sources even state that Jack told his brother, Jean Paul, that if things with his wife went south, he would make her and his family disappear. However, how much of this is really true, nobody knows. Though Jack's brother verified that Jack did tell him if things didn't work out, he would leave and no one would be able to find him. Number 20. Matias Perez was a Portuguese citizen that moved to Cuba and had an interest in aeronautics. In 1856, he bought a hot air balloon named V de Paris, made by French pilot Eugene Goddard, for 1,200 pesos. Matias had a friendly relationship with the pilot, and on May 21, 1856, they took a flight together. After that, Perez planned to take a second flight on June 29, 1856. Local newspapers reported that the wind was strong the day the flight was scheduled, but he didn't want to disappoint the thousands of people that were eager to see him take flight. So at 7 p.m., he finally did. The hot air balloon rose over 2,000 meters in height and headed northwest. It was last seen at dusk before it mysteriously disappeared. The Spanish general started a search that covered all the corners of Havana, but no trace of the balloon or Perez were found. His disappearance earned him a place in Cuban history and popular culture. The Cuban Stamps Agency honored his 100th anniversary flight and as one of Cuban's first pilots with two stamps, showing Plaza de Marte, the location where he departed, and Correra Fort, where he landed his first flight in 1856. In 1969, Perez's story was made into a comic series with a plotline that aliens had abducted the pilot and that he was taken away to a faraway planet. Number 19. Warminster is a small town in England. 
This event was nicknamed the Warminster Thing after an unexplained phenomenon occurred there. The mystery started on Christmas morning of 1964. There were several weird noises heard coming from the sky above the town. Then the inhabitants of the town saw a strange object in the sky and they thought that they would soon be invaded by aliens. This made news around the world and there were even reports of UFO sightings leading to cars temporarily breaking down. Whatever they saw that Christmas morning, they named it the Warminster Thing. In June of 1965, Gordon Faulkner took an image of a UFO that was shaped like a flying saucer. The Daily Mirror published the story on September 10th. It gained Warminster a lot of publicity and within weeks, thousands of people began to converge on the town to see what the strange phenomenon was for themselves. Many years later, in the 90s, it was discovered that the photo was simply a fake. In 2015, a conference was held to mark the 50th anniversary of the original sightings. Several UFO enthusiasts and experts proclaimed Warminster to be the British UFO capital, making it UK's version of Roswell, New Mexico. The last sighting that happened in Warminster happened in June of 2017 when a resident recorded a video showing an odd light circling in the sky. Many wonder what makes Warminster a hotbed of UFO activity. Many speculate that a nearby military base called the Battlesbury Barracks are behind the mysterious sightings. Number 18. On December 24th, the Battle of the Bulge was interrupted by a little-known truce when three American soldiers, one of them wounded, knocked on the door of 12-year-old Fritz Vinken's home where he lived with his mother, Elizabeth. Elizabeth let them all inside and was even able to communicate with one of the soldiers in French. Through him, she learned that they had lost their unit three days earlier and had been wandering in the snow ever since. Then there was another knock at the door, and this time, four German soldiers stood before Elizabeth. She was aware that she was offering sanctuary to the enemy, which was a grave crime, but the Germans were lost and they were hoping for shelter. Knowing that she had no choice but to let them in, she told them that they could only enter the home if they left their guns outside, seeing that it was a holy occasion. The Germans complied. After this, Elizabeth made sure to take away the guns of the Americans as well. As a result, the seven soldiers sat down for Christmas dinner together with Elizabeth and Fritz. One of the German soldiers even helped the Americans with first aid. That night, Elizabeth prayed for the war to end on behalf of the soldiers. The next morning, they wished each other a Merry Christmas and then built a stretcher for the wounded American. After breakfast, the Germans pointed the Americans in the right direction so that they could find their unit. After the war ended, Fritz found two of the American soldiers who had taken shelter in his home, but he could never locate any of the Germans. Number 17. On December 23, 1974, three girls set out on a Christmas shopping trip in Fort Worth. Rachel Arnold, Renee Wilson, and Julie Ann Mosley. They were supposed to be home by 4 p.m. When the girls didn't return home, the families became concerned and went to the shopping center. They found their car in the upper level of the parking lot. It appeared that the girls made it back to the car because the gifts they had bought were found inside. The following day, a letter arrived, allegedly written by Rachel, claiming they'd been taken on a week-long trip to Houston. But the letter didn't match Rachel's handwriting, so no one believed she had truly written it. Meanwhile, witnesses were stepping forward to share what they had seen. One claimed to have seen the girls in the back of a security patrol vehicle, but owing to the lack of significant leads, the police presumed the girls were runaways. Years later, a man came forward claiming to have seen the girls in the parking lot getting hurled into a van by a man. The witness confronted the man, who yelled out to him that it was a family dispute and the witness should stay out of it. There was even speculation that one of the girls might have known the man, but decades after they disappeared, there are still no developments in the case, despite following countless leads, dozens of searches, and interviewing hundreds of people. Number 16. On December 18th, 2011, 23-year-old Phoenix Colden left her family home in Missouri. Her father believed that she was headed to a convenience store down the street or to a friend's house, but her car was later found abandoned and still running in the middle of a traffic lane in a dangerous section of East St. Louis. She left her glasses, her purse, a pair of shoes, and her ID inside the vehicle. Had she run away? A look into her past supported such speculation. Phoenix grew up in a religious and strict household but had lived with a boyfriend, something that her parents were strongly opposed to since she was not yet married. Hence, she hid this from her parents, but the truth was found out once she went missing. It was also discovered that she never enrolled for the upcoming semester in college. 
So was it possible that she had run away to carve a new path on her own? The story turned out to be even more mysterious when two birth certificates of Phoenix's were found with two different surnames. On top of this, DNA evidence gathered from her car showed that Phoenix and her parents were the only people to have ever been in the car. Even the activities on her bank accounts ceased, and she could not be reached by cell phone or on social media. If she had truly run away, wouldn't she have at least left some sort of a trace? Phoenix's disappearance is yet to be solved. Number 15. A row of unidentified flying objects was spotted in the skies above northern Montana on Christmas night in 2019. While some people thought they might be witnessing an alien invasion, and very few thought they had spotted Santa's sleigh on its way home to the North Pole, the best explanation for the row of lights in the night sky was Elon Musk's new Starlink satellite system. On November 11th, Musk's SpaceX venture launched 60 Starlink satellites from Space Launch Complex at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. According to SpaceX's website, the satellites were launched to develop a new low-latency broadband internet system to meet the needs of consumers across the globe. SpaceX has launched more than 420 satellites into orbit so far, and won't reach significant operational capacity until at least 800 satellites are placed into orbit, so the company still has a way to go. Despite conceding, Elon's Starlink project came with good intentions. Astronomers are concerned about how the sheer size of the Starlink network would cause problems for stargazers. Meanwhile, a Chinese scientist has suggested that a giant laser should be used to identify and remove unused satellites in order to clear out Earth's orbit and make it less dangerous for future space travelers. The Starlink constellations must be a bummer to alien hunters who are getting excited over mysterious lights that are coming in from no planet other than our own. Who knows if too many shiny things in the sky could be drowning out a message from real aliens. Number 14. Patrick Warren and David Spencer were two English schoolboys who disappeared on Boxing Day in 1996. They were last seen by a petrol station attendant who gave them a packet of biscuits. He then saw the boys walking toward the local shopping center, and that was the last time they were seen alive. The police initially treated the boys' disappearance as a normal missing persons inquiry, and despite no confirmed sightings of them after Boxing Day, senior officers told the media that there was no reason to suppose that they had come to any harm. Professor David Wilson, a criminologist who studied the police's initial response to the boys' disappearance, concluded that David and Patrick's working-class background affected how their case was being handled. Their disappearance received little media attention, but their faces appeared on milk cartons in a campaign launched by the National Missing Persons Helpline in April of 1997. The local media nicknamed the boys the Milk Carton Kids, but after four weeks, there were no major leads. The appeal also failed to catapult the case to the attention of the national media. In 2006, the police announced that they were close to solving the mystery, but no one has ever been charged with a crime relating to the disappearance of the two boys. Later, Brian Field, a well-known criminal, was named a suspect. However, police were not able to secure a confession or get any tangible evidence to connect Brian to the disappearance. In 2016, police stated that both boys had likely passed away and they would never close the case until they discovered the truth of what happened to the two boys. Number 13. Two weeks before Charles Lindbergh made his famous 1927 flight from New York to Paris, a French pilot named Charles Nungesser and a navigator, Francis Colley, vanished while trying to cross the Atlantic in the opposite direction. Nungesser was a Hollywood stunt pilot and Kali had flying records over the Mediterranean. Both men had also served as French fighter pilots during World War I. Their plane had been modified to carry over 1,000 gallons of fuel, enough for at least 40 hours in the air, and it was outfitted with a watertight bottom and detachable landing gear that would allow the pilots to cut down on weight. They plotted a route that would take the plane over England and Ireland, then towards New York, on May 8, 1927. The flight from takeoff to touchdown was expected to take roughly 40 hours. The French duo was last sighted over southern Ireland at around 10.30 a.m., at which point they flew off into the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. The plane was not outfitted with a radio, so the next day, thousands of people gathered in Manhattan waiting for its landing. When the appointed time came, and there was no sign of them, search planes were dispatched to scout along the American coast. 
Over the next few days, they became the subject of an international rescue operation. Over the years, there have been investigations to determine what happened to them. Most believe that the plane came down in the Atlantic due to a rain squall, but the plane has never been recovered. The leading theory is that the plane may have crashed in Maine and remained one of the most tantalizing mysteries in aviation. Number 12. On December 8, 2000, Irishman Trevor Dealey disappeared in Dublin. He'd been walking home from his office's Christmas party at around 4 a.m., but never arrived home. After Trevor failed to appear at work on Monday morning, his absence was looked into. It became clear that no one had seen or spoken to him since Thursday night. Over the following days, Trevor's family and friends put up hundreds of posters, handed out thousands of leaflets, and went from house to house and business to business inquiring if people had seen him. His friends even went so far as to acquire CCTV footage that was being used to investigate Trevor's disappearance. The last possible sighting of him was captured by CCTV at around 4.14 a.m. It showed Trevor walking past the AIB bank with an umbrella. Police have also established that a man in dark clothing passed that camera about 34 seconds after Trevor went by. That man appeared to be following him. The mystery man has never come forward, nor has he been identified despite many appeals. At the time of his disappearance, an extensive search of the area was made and the River Daughter and Grand Canal were examined. Potential witnesses were hard to track down, but dozens of night workers and party goers were interviewed. Not a single piece of information was worth pursuing. Trevor's whereabouts remain unknown and the case continues to spark interest. On the 19th anniversary of Trevor's disappearance, police urged anybody with any information to please come forward. Crime Stoppers is still offering a reward for anyone with information relating to the disappearance of Trevor as well. Hopefully one day, the truth of what happened to him will be discovered. Number 11. A Visit from St. Nicholas, commonly known as The Night Before Christmas, is a poem first published anonymously in a New York newspaper in 1823. It was not until 13 years later that Clement Clark Moore, a professor and a poet, was named as the author. A story emerged that his housekeeper sent the piece in which he had written for his kids to the newspaper without his knowledge, and in 1844, the poem was finally included in an anthology of Moore's work. The family of Henry Livingston Jr. then claimed that their father had been reciting a visit from St. Nicholas to them for 15 years before it was published. Livingston's Dutch background became a key component in this mystery. His mother was Dutch, as are many references in the poem. Also piling up in the case against Moore is the fact that at least four of Livingston's children and even a neighbor girl said they remembered Henry telling them the tale of St. Nick as early as 1807. They even said that they had evidence of a dated, handwritten copy of the original poem with revisions and scratch marks throughout. Unfortunately, the house containing this gem had burned down, taking the Livingston's family proof with it. Later, when a professor analyzed poetry by both authors, he declared that there was no possible way Moore could have written the poem. According to the professor, the style and content of the poem were completely different than anything else Moore had ever written. There's still no definitive proof for either writer, though. To this day, it's one family's word against the others. Moore is the author who usually gets the credit and will likely remain that way unless Livingston's descendants can prove otherwise. Four handwritten copies of the poem are known to exist and three are in museums. The fourth copy, written out and signed by Moore, was purchased for $280,000 by a private collector in 2006. Number 10. A fire destroyed the Sodder family home in Fayetteville on Christmas Eve of 1945. The house was inhabited by George Sodder, his wife Jeannie, and nine out of their ten children. Four of the George and Jeannie's nine children would escape the fire along with their parents, but five would not. But at the same time, their bodies would never be found. The Sodder home was made into a memorial site for the lost children. But in the 1950s, the family started to doubt that they lost five of the children in that fire. After all, their bodies were nowhere to be found in the aftermath. A witness also came forward and said that he saw people throwing balls of fire at the house, meaning the cause of the fire was not faulty wiring as was originally thought. Another witness also stated that she saw the children in a passing car while the house was set aflame. The family opted to advertise a reward on a billboard with pictures of their children for any information that may help solve the mystery. 
There was something else that was bothering George though. The fire department stated the source of the fire was faulty wiring, even though the house had been recently inspected and rewired. George suspected the fire was the result of arson. He even considered the possibility that the Sicilian Mafia had caused arson to cover their tracks after taking his five children away. He thought his criticisms of fascism in Italy had provoked them. There was evidence to suggest this too. An insurance salesman who had confronted George about his anti-Mussolini talk was on the coroner's jury that had ruled the fire was an accident. The investigation into the mysterious disappearance of the five children continued into the 21st century, but the family has still had no luck. Number 9. Glenn Miller was a famous musician. He was well known in the swing era as an arranger, composer, and band leader. On December 15, 1944, Alton Glenn Miller mysteriously disappeared. He was flying to Paris from Bedford in the United Kingdom the day that his plane mysteriously vanished while flying over the English Channel. It was a clear, cloudless day and there were two US military officers on board the plane. Insane conspiracy theories about Alton's disappearance have sprouted throughout the years, much to the annoyance of his family. Some say that he never even boarded the plane. Eisenhower sent him to negotiate a Nazi surrender and Alton did not survive the mission. A more realistic theory is that he made it to Paris and passed away from a heart attack, but most of these theories have been disproven time and time again. An investigator into his disappearance has said that he went through all the possibilities to either disprove or verify them. He then conceded that a portion of the public is hard to persuade, even with logic, hence the conspiracy theories. The investigator was none other than a member of the Miller family, Dennis Sprague, who claims that he knows what happened. He believes the plane went down and Miller passed away in the crash. He acquired this information from investigations that occurred shortly after the disappearance. He has added that the investigation report was sent off to the USA and boxed away, never to be seen by anyone until he learned of their existence. He said that it was always right in front of the eyes of the researchers that looked into the case, but he was the only one to seek it out. Number 8. On Sunday, the 28th of December, 2014, an aircraft disappeared while en route to Madia from Karasparu. The pilot lost tower connection just 15 minutes after taking off. 51-year-old cargo handler David Bisnath was on board. They carried mining supplies on board as well. The Guyana Civil Aviation Authority responded to this sudden disappearance by deploying a search and rescue mission. The search was extensive and a coordinated effort involving helicopters and other winged aircraft. These aircraft searched over 230 hours. Ground search parties were also deployed to search the thickly forested area. They followed several leads, but there were no significant breakthroughs. They also combed through the nearby mountainous area without success. The rescue operation was supported by the Minister of Public Works, the Police Force, the Ministry of Health, and the Forestry Commission, among others. Villagers, miners, and relatives were interviewed to determine whether there had been any sightings. Additional resources, such as specialized equipment, were funneled into the search after three weeks of disappointment. In the end, the Minister of Public Works and the Civil Aviation Authority arrived at a very difficult decision. They decided to stop all search operations. While it's still unclear what happened to the aircraft, the Ministry and the Aviation Authority have empathized with the affected families and friends of those in the mysterious disappearance. The search operations lasted a total of 21 days. Number 7. Kevin Showalter was a 20-year-old college student. He was on his way home with his girlfriend, Deborah Emilita, on Christmas Eve in 1973 when their car got a flat tire. Deborah parked the car and Kevin got out to change it. It was 11 p.m. and the streets were dark and people in the neighborhood were mostly asleep. As Kevin crouched down to get to work on the tire, a car ran into him and drove off. Nobody properly saw the car, and Kevin passed away by the time the ambulance arrived a few minutes later. A few weeks went by, and Kevin's mother visited the police station to retrieve his personal belongings, but they told her that they had been lost. On top of this, the investigation was going nowhere. She wanted answers, but they told her she wouldn't get any and that she should move on with her life. She would later say, I felt if the mystery of his death couldn't be solved, it would be as though he never existed. His mother, Lucille, decided to take matters into her own hands. She searched for reports of damaged cars and searched the crime scene for evidence that police may have missed. She even interviewed people that had driven past the scene of the hit and run. She eventually shared her findings with the police, but they turned on her. 
Things changed when a witness by the name of Harvey Malov told her that he drove past a minute after the hit and run and saw a middle-aged man talking to Deborah. Three years after Kevin passed away, a one-man jury was assigned to his case and concluded that the police could have done a better job of investigating the crime. Things turned worse when it was discovered that the green paint on Kevin's clothing might have been planted on him after the crime took place. Someone was covering up the hit and run, and Harvey Malove became a main suspect, though he was never prosecuted. Number 6. Derek James Ingerbretson disappeared in a national forest near Rock Point in Oregon on December 5, 1998. He was looking for Christmas trees with his father and grandfather when he wandered away. His father reported him missing later that evening. A motorist helped him do this by traveling to the nearest resort and dialing 911. They began to look for him immediately, but later that day, a blizzard hit in the area where he was reported missing. This interfered with their search and obliterated tracks that could have been used to trace Derek's steps. Volunteers found a candy wrapper and a Bonanza school bookmark nearby some days after the disappearance. Derek had been enrolled at the school previously, but there's no telling whether it was his. After searching the area without any breakthroughs, authorities observed that temperatures where Derek disappeared had dropped below zero. It was also quite snowy and windy. The police believed that these conditions would have made it difficult for him to survive. The police also considered the disappearance as an abduction. There was a black Honda in the area that day. An unidentified man was driving it around. A witness stepped forward to say that he witnessed a man struggling with a boy later that day. The witness didn't think anything of it because he thought the man was the boy's father. It was unclear whether this was relevant to Derek's case. Derek's disappearance continues to raise questions. The authorities continue to look for answers, and in 2004, investigators say that they found a prime suspect, Frank Milligan, a convicted criminal who was serving a 60-year sentence at the time. Another prisoner even informed police that Frank bragged about being behind the disappearance of the missing boy. Eventually, Frank confessed to the crime, and he agreed to lead authorities to the body, but nothing ever turned up. After this, he recanted his confession and was not charged as a result. Number 5. Michael William Negret was an 18-year-old student at the University of California in Los Angeles. He vanished in December of 1999. He was a popular student at the university and was on a music scholarship. On December 10th, after attending a party, he returned to his room to play video games with a friend. At 4 a.m., he went to congratulate the other player. The friend of his was the last person to see him alive. When the police started to investigate his disappearance, they interviewed his close friends and people living on the same floor as him. None of them had seen him after 4 a.m. A few alleged witnesses said they might have seen him leaving the building at about 4.35 a.m., but the authorities could not substantiate this information. However, they found out about a Caucasian man who was seen on their floor on the night of Negret's disappearance. Nobody knew him or why he was there. The case went from a missing persons case to a homicide case. The police shared a sketch of the man with the public and asked for him to step forward for questioning, but he never did. At the same time, police hounds were used to trace Michael's scent to a bus stop across campus. Investigators chose not to pursue this lead because they felt the dogs could not be trusted. In any case, 500 leads were chased down and they amounted to nothing. His parents paid private detectives to look into the case and even set up a $100,000 reward for information that may help solve it, but their efforts didn't bear any results. In 2013, Michael's brother said he believed Michael had taken drugs when he left the building and got abducted, but what happened to Michael is still a mystery. Number 4. Simon Parks, a British citizen who was in the Royal Navy, disappeared in Gibraltar in December of 1986. The crew on the HMS Illustrious got shore leave, so the shipmates had gone ashore on December 12th. They ended up at a horseshoe bar, which Simon left, telling his friends he wanted to look for food. He was last seen at the Heil and the Wall pub, where there was an ongoing naval function. Witnesses say that he was drunk. When he went missing, 250 men looked for him, checking all of the places he had visited. Simon had left all of his possessions on the ship, and among his possessions were his passport and Christmas presents for his family. He'd been writing to them, telling him that he was excited to be home for Christmas, and he'd even secured special dockside passes so his family could greet him when the illustrious arrived in Portsmouth. So it was clear that he intended to go home and did not simply run away. In 2001, Petty Officer Alan Grimson ended the lives of two young men. 
one in 1997 and another in 1998. They were in the Royal Navy at the time. These cases led to an investigation into Simon's disappearance to see whether Officer Alan Grimson could have also been behind his sudden disappearance. After all, he was serving aboard the Illustrious at the same time. The search for the truth never really stopped. Various leads have led to searches being conducted in 2003 and another in 2019 after the authorities got a tip, but Simon is yet to be found and the mystery is yet to be solved. Number 3. Christy Lynn Farney vanished on December 14, 1978. She was six years old and had just testified against her father, Kenneth Farney, in front of a jury. Afterward, she went back to the foster home where she'd been staying for three days. She then set off to Jackson Elementary School, but she wouldn't return home that afternoon. The school would later say that she'd been absent the entire day. Nobody knew what happened to her. Her father and stepmother were interviewed by the police after her biological mother had passed away the previous year, and polygraph examinations were given to the both of them. But neither person was able to further the investigation and they were ruled out as suspects. Nothing suspicious had been reported that day, and searches didn't turn up any significant leads. Police believed that a delay between the time Christy went missing and the time of her disappearance was reported and may have interfered with the investigation. In 1983, there was speculation that Henry Lee Lucas, a notorious criminal at the time, had abducted Christy from the street, but these were merely conspiracy theories. Even though Henry Lucas had confessed to being behind Christy's disappearance, his confession was disproven and he ended up recanting it. There have been other theories regarding Christy's disappearance. Some believe that Christie's immediate family took her away to live in a safer environment since her life at home with her father was difficult. However, there's been no evidence to support this theory. Christie's case is the oldest of a missing child in the county. Medford Police reopened her case in 2008, but it remains unsolved. Number 2. Sumbath Sumphone was a well-known member of the civil society in Lao. On December 15, 2012, CCTV captured his abduction after he was stopped by the police then driven away in a pickup truck. He was never seen again. After his disappearance, the European Union, the United Nations, and parliaments across the world all expressed concern for his safety. They all urged the government to ensure his safety, but the Prime Minister ignored these calls. Hillary Clinton, who was the Secretary of State at the time, reached out to the government to pursue a transparent investigation of the incident and do everything in its power to bring the immediate safe and return of Sumbath. A Dutch senator who visited the area in March of 2013 said that if officials think the issue of his disappearance will go away, they're wrong. Another delegation from Denmark and Belgium said that the government is not willing to resolve the issue of his disappearance and they rejected an offer for assistance in the investigation. A year after his disappearance, there was another global call to look for his abduction. The government claimed that they were investigating the case, but they were reluctant to update the public on any progress, and many believed the government had suspended the investigation. Sumbath was a champion of development in the rural areas nearby. He'd been awarded the UN's Human Resource Development Award for his activism. It seems clear that his disappearance was politically motivated and that his family may never know what became of him after the last night the CCTV footage captured him alive. Number 1. Eight people disappeared on a flight in the Amazon on December 2, 2018. On board the plane were Amazonian Indians, a teacher, his wife, and their three children. The pilot radioed his friend and said, It looks like I've lost a cylinder. There's oil leaking onto the windscreen. I'm going to land. His friend, who was flying over the Amazonian rainforest, told him that there was no landing strip there anymore. The friend also told him to try to land on the water, but he had already made up his mind. The signal cut out after that. The friend went in search of him, but he encountered a rainstorm that hindered his search. He flew over Independencia, where a strip was built to provide access to a mine nearby. With the mine being long abandoned, the jungle started to spread out onto the landing strip, but the pilot allegedly attempted to make the landing anyway. The Brazilian Air Force started a search that accumulated over 128 hours of flying by search and rescue aircraft and helicopters. Two weeks passed and there was nothing to show for the entire effort. A witness stepped forward and said they saw a plane flying low. However, the Defense Ministry has refused to initiate ground searches despite the appeal of various organizations of the indigenous people. The pilot's daughter said that although she's been doing everything she can to find out the truth of what happened, there's a lack of help from authorities. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to click that like button. If you loved it, maybe consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our latest uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.